In this lecture, we're going to be focusing in on actually using the Kohler curve, which, as you recall, is the uh, equilibrium saturation vapor pressure over a curved solution droplet. Uh, so if you remember, or you recall, uh, we had the curvature effect, which tended to drive the equilibrium saturation vapor pressure off to infinity, and you had the solute effect, which tended to cause the um, saturation vapor pressure uh, to decrease below a, a saturation ratio of 1 or a supersaturation of 0% or relative humidity of 100%. These are all uh, equivalent here. Uh, this is the uh, equilibrium uh, saturation vapor pressure over a plain surface of pure water. Um, and then we have several different particles. Um, each particle has its own Kohler color, color curve because it has a different mass it has a different Van Hoff factor and a different molecular weight. And here we have several different masses of the exact same chemical composition, in this case ammonium sulfate. And so the way that we use the Kohler curve is to pick a particle size uh, for a particular particle and particular uh, chemical composition, and then we discover the Kohler curve for that one. And let's just take the 8 times 10 to the minus 19th uh, kilogram particle. Um, and in this case, that's the green line, which is up here at the very top part, um, just to make this easier to, to look at. And when I look at a Kohler curve, what it tells me is that uh, there is an inflection point, which is the critical supersaturation that that particle has to achieve, has to be exposed to, in order for it to continue to grow into a cloud droplet. So in this example, the critical supersaturation for this particle is about 0 0.46. Um, uh, so about, that's equivalent to 100.46% uh, uh, relative humidity, a saturation ratio of 1.045. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> and so that's the critical supersaturation. It also has a critical radius um, on how large that particle will be. So let's take that particle. Um, and start off with a relative humidity that's less than 100%. Um, as long as that relative humidity is less than 100%, um, that particle is going to grow. Uh, and at a relative humidity of 100%, that particle will be about 0 0.1 uh, micrometers um, in uh, radius. And then as the relative humidity continues to grow, when the relative humidity grows to 100.2%, um, uh, then the equilibrium would dictate that, that particle would grow in size to be a little bit bigger than 0 0.1 uh, micrometers. And if the relative humidity continued to rise in the environment all the way up to 100.4, uh, then that particle to be in equilibrium would continue to grow uh, to larger. Uh, at this point, it's about uh, 0 0.16 or 0 0.17 micrometers. And then once it, uh, if you have an environmental supersaturation, in this case a uh, relative humidity of 100.5%, uh, um, then when that particle reaches its critical radius, um, it's still supersaturated. Um, there's still more water vapor in the air than necessary for equilibrium, which means that that particle will continue to grow. And it will, and as that particle continues to grow, the equilibrium saturation vapor pressure decreases um, and if the environment stayed at 0 0.5, then the saturation, uh, the supersaturation of that particle is going to get bigger and bigger, and that particle is going to continue to grow. And it will continue to grow um, uh, as long as the relative humidity stays above 100%. So we had a critical supersaturation, a critical radius. Um, if the environmental uh, humidity and didn't reach that level, that particle would never be activated into a cloud droplet. Um, it would stay as a haze droplet. Uh, any particle that uh, stays at an equilibrium size that's less than its critical radius is referred to as a haze droplet, and anything that grows beyond that critical radius is referred to as a cloud droplet. Um, we know that visibility outside, when you're looking in the sky, is impacted by the number of particles by the size of the particles, by the angle of the light that you're looking at, and it's also impacted by relative humidity. Because as the humidity increases, even at relative humidities below 
particles are growing, they're uptaking water. Um, and as they uptake water, they get bigger, which makes them more efficient at scattering light. And so a very poor visibility day would be one that has a lot of particles in the atmosphere, but also has high humidity. So every one of those particles is bigger, presenting a larger cross-sectional area for scattering of radiation. <clears throat> so you can see that as the particles get bigger, uh, in this case, the curves move in this direction, which means that the critical supersaturation gets smaller uh, and the critical radius gets larger. Um, and so that's just a function of the larger the mass of the solute, the smaller the barrier for the activation of the cloud droplet, and therefore the largest particles are actually the ones that are most likely to act as cloud condensation nuclei. So for example, for this particle, you only had to have a relative humidity of 100.1% in order for this particle to activate into a cloud droplet. But for the smallest particle, you had to have almost 100.5% relative humidity in order to activate that cloud droplet, or activate that particle into a cloud droplet. And um, so there are uh, situations in the atmosphere when uh, you know, some of the larger particles will actually activate and others will not. Um, because there will be some maximum saturation that's actually achieved inside the cloud and that will dictate the number droplet uh, concentration inside the cloud and to a certain extent that also dictates the likelihood that that cloud is to rain in a warm rain process because if you activate only a small number of particles then they are going to um, be a site for condensation and those smaller number of particles will grow very large um, and be more likely to precipitate where if you have a very high supersaturation, you activate a lot of uh, droplets, um, then those droplets are competing for the available vapor, which makes the overall size distribution of the cloud droplets smaller, which means that cloud is less likely to rain. So the Kohler curve is great because it allows you to um, predict the behavior of an individual particle, but it's also difficult because in order to model cloud growth, you would actually have to have a Kohler curve for every single particle that was in the atmosphere. You'd have to know the size, the chemical composition of those particles. Um, you have to know the updraft uh, velocity so that you can calculate the supersaturation that would be observed. Um, and you would have to be able to do that uh, at the micro scale in order to be able to determine the number concentration and ultimately the liquid water content of an individual cloud. That makes this an exceptionally difficult uh, scenario to model, um, but uh, that's going to be the next step, is we're actually going to start modeling the growth rate of individual droplets, um, and in this class we're never going to take it to the next step and look at a growth of a population of droplets. Uh, that will be an advanced course in cloud microphysics.